in this presentation, together with Lorenzo, we will show you um, um, the case study we have chosen uh, in a more detail. Um, so I will start presenting you uh, the history of the origin of Piazza Puntoni, and, uh, and then in more detail, we will see the characteristics characteristics of the buildings that overlook it before going this afternoon to see the buildings. So Piazza Puntoni is a, a square uh, located in the northeast area of the historic center uh, of Bologna within the university area. Uh, surely it is uh, not one of the most famous squares uh, uh, in the city, but uh, it has a particular history uh, strictly linked uh, to the university history. Uh, the area where it stands has been much debated in these last years because it is a complicated area for its management um, and uh, it is often uh, the place for protests and gatherings by students uh, uh, attending university. Uh, let's take a closer look to the square and above all to the particular shape it has, which derives from the historical events uh, linked to its realization. Um, in fact, Piazza Puntoni is uh, not one of the historic squares of the city, as I was saying, but it is a recently built square, uh, resulting from the demolitions carried out in the 30s in this area. Uh, actually, it is uh, not even considered uh, a square sometimes because uh, uh, it seems more than um, more a crossing point than a square uh, because uh, it has a vehicular accessibility even if uh, in a restricted uh, traffic zone and a pedestrian accessibility. Um, However, uh, it is uh, overlooked by buildings have an important public and social function um, and it is frequented uh, by uh, many people in uh, the same moment. Um, let's talk about its history. Uh, Bologna was one of the first cities in Italy to have a, a, a town plan, uh, which was approved in 1889. Following the drafting, the drafting of this plan, some agreements were signed between the municipality of Bologna and the university to transform the university area. The redesign of Piazza Puntoni is part of the last steps of this reorganization. And in this map, we can see in bold the university buildings, which were already designed or built, and the urban fabric. As you can see in the uh, uh, red circle, um, in the place of the square, there were residential buildings with the uh, conformation of the terraced area houses we uh, saw in the previous presentation. Then, uh, this is the one of the project versions <laughs> that we have uh, about the redesign of the area. And we see um, what uh, was the arrangement uh, planned for the area with uh, um, a new university building facing on the uh, square uh, and the historical urban fabric, which, which had to be largely demolished, as you can see inside the circle. These are some re um, graphic reconstructions of the project. Uh, here is the um, location of Piazza Puntoni. Um, so the square in the project had to have a rectangular shape and the student house uh, was planned on it from the beginning uh, and it was uh, actually really built. Um, but uh, opposite uh, the um, student house uh, next to Palazzo Poggio, which of course remained in the project because it was the headquarter of university. Uh, uh, the demolition of the actual department uh, of economics was planned and the construction of a university building was uh, planned in front of Palazzo Poggi uh, by demolishing the residential buildings. Uh, you can see it uh, outside our windows. <laughs> that is the 
part of this building because it is the Faculty of Economy uh, that had to have this uh, form, this configuration, but only a part of it has been uh, uh, built and uh, for the other part, as we can see, uh, the residential buildings uh, remained. Uh, the munitions uh, started uh, in 1933, probably, and lasted a few years. But uh, perhaps uh, the Second World War or the lack of funds uh, slowed the construction. Uh, and and uh, until the 50s, no buildings had yet been built, not uh, uh, even the uh, student house that we see today. Um, so uh, only residential buildings had been demolished, only a part, let's say, of the residential buildings had been demolished, and uh, um, the construction of the student house became, uh, began in uh, about a few years later, so about uh, 1952 or three, if I'm not wrong. Um, and the um, Department of Economics was not demolished, um, uh, and the, the building, the Faculty of Economy, was only partially built. So uh, this is the current situation of the buildings facing on the square, uh, with the, the square that does not correspond to the original project we saw, um, which was made in the 30s. And then uh, um, as uh, uh, this particular shape because of unfinished intervention, uh, now uh, we will see in more detail the characteristics of the buildings that overlook uh, the square, starting from the university one. So Lorenzo will present you uh, the university building, then we will see the non-university non buildings facing on the square. Okay, so good morning. And the first building to be presented, uh, of course, is one of the most symbolic of the University of Bologna and it's Palazzo Poggi, this building. Uh, for the purpose of the Adresismic project, we will focus on the part facing the square, that is the part dedicated to the university library. Um, the building was uh, built in 5049 and has been the headquarter of the university since 1803 during the Napoleonic era. The structure is typical of monumental buildings, thick masonry walls, wa uh, wide walls and the classical Bolognese portico on the ground floor. Currently, the part we studied is used mainly for offices and the university library. In the last 40 years, no major structural intervention have been carried out, only some minor maintenance works. The plan from the 30s on the slide uh, give an idea of the size of the building uh, and also of its architectural complexity. The picture of the left refers to the entire Palazzo Poggi, while uh, the one on the right is in the context of the university district. Other drawings for, uh, from the 30s are shown here. On the left, a perspective of the inner courtyard uh, that is not visi uh, visible um, from the street. On the right, the, uh, the prospect on Via Zamboni. This is a more general perspective frames uh, um, that put uh, the building in relation to Piazza Puntoni as it appeared uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. The project was to make the structure the center of the university life in Bologna. After the first general introduction, we return to focus on the part facing Piazza Puntoni. The elevation, visible in the two figures above, is not porticoed, but maintains the same architectural scheme already present on Via Zamboni. The photos of the interiors refer to the area affected by the Adri Seismic project, you can see the inner courtyard, the main hall, and the vertical connecting stairways. Let's move on to the functions, uh, to the various rooms on the ground floor. On the right-hand side, that of the, um, uh, that of the square, the prevailing use is for services and custodian's room. Uh, around the inner courtyard are, of, are more offices. The large uh, library is located on the side adjacent to the Department of Economic Science, which you can see here in the lower part in yellow. 
The upper floor is almost entirely used for the lecture hall and the surrounding rooms, uh, also shown here in purple, serve uh, as archives for the oldest volumes. On the side uh, facing Piazza Pontoni, there are further offices. The material was obtained in various ways. The architectural plan were already in possession of the university. Uh, and from the photogrammetric and laser scanner surveys, we were able to obtain uh, also the elevation. No tests were carried out to assess the quality of the material uh, because the, the building, of course, have uh, many restrictions. The assumptions made are those reported here. So the building is in excellent condition and there are no obvious scenes of cracks. All materials used are of good, uh, good quality. All the vertical structures are made of brick boards and the floors are vaulted or made of wooden structure. Here you can see some picture um, on the right of the attic that is in very good condition. And uh, you can also notice the metal reinforcement elements inserted on the wooden truss during the 80s. On the basis uh, of the data collected, the following potential criticalities were highlighted, that are the possible deformability of, floor, of floors and roofs, presence of porticos in the elevation on Via Zamboni, possible absence of connection between the many elements, and possible trust from the roofs. Furthermore, as I lighted, the building is extremely articulated in plan. Uh, this could generate significant torsional effects in case of seismic action. From what has been obtained, uh, the most probable mechanism uh, for uh, the elevation facing Piazza Pontoni are uh, the overturning out of plane and the overturning out um, of the top part. So we will now analyze the only building that has concrete elements, that is the university student house and canteen. The original project was by the engineer Rinaldi, uh, carried out after the Second World War, and the work was completed by the architect Riguzzi in the 1955. It is therefore the most recent building on the square. As already mentioned, the building has a mixed concrete uh, uh, masonry structure. It, uh, also as parts which for architectural reason uh, have a cons considerable span, 10 meter. In addition, the building is used as a canteen on the ground floor and as a student residence on the upper floors, which uh, about 100 students living there. The structure is still the original one. The intervention over the years have been mainly for mountains. Uh, the slide shows the plan from the 70s and which shows small architectural renovations. Unfortunately, the structural plans are not available. These have been searched for in the university and municipal archives. On the left uh, is the building of uh, the student room, uh, on the right, the basement of the building. As in previous slide, there are drawings from the 70s, uh, in this case, uh, a typical section, and we, where you can see also the basement of the building. There are numerous uh, photographs of the inauguration, especially of the interior. On the left is a view of the staircase. On the right, a view of uh, a common room for students. These photos show uh, on the left the, the original canteen and on the right uh, a model of the building. Some photographs of the exterior of the building are shown here. Uh, the concrete columns on the ground floor and their slenderness in relation to the mass of the upper floors uh, are very evident. On the afternoon uh, tour, you can get a better idea of the proportion of the structure. These photographs refer to the terrace on the top floor and one of the kitchens uh, in the student residence. Each uh, kitchen serves about 20 students. The buildings has an L shape. The photographs of the left show the internal courtyard, which is covered on the ground floor. The solution was adopted to allow a higher number of seats uh, in the canteen. On the right is a room uh, in the student residence. Now let's just briefly look at the main function of the building. 
As mentioned, the ground floor is almost entirely dedicated to the university canteen, and the color on the plan is green. On the side facing Piazza Pontoni, there is the entrance of the student's residence, uh, which is blue. Uh, the floors are all the same except for the first and the last uh, level. A typical plan is shown here. The red parts are common area, uh, while the blue ones uh, are the rooms. Uh, it is interesting to note that in the right-hand corridor, uh, which is almost vertical, there are no supports and the ceiling has a span of almost 10 meters. In the other corridor, on the other hand, the presence of pillars to break up the distance is evident. The top floor is set back from the external perimeter and the space created is used as a terrace. It can be seen that one of the lower part, uh, the walls are aligned with the columns of the floor below. On the right hand side, the partition are placed in correspondence with the corridor of the lower floor without any vertical supports. A laser scanner and photogrammetric survey was carried out also in this case for the building and the plants were already in possession of the University of Bologna. Also in this case, uh, we haven't um, found any structural plants. The structure is in good condition and only small cracks were found on external elevation, probably due to the construction of the stairwell. In general, good quality materials were found and uh, the reinforcement of beams and columns, as uh, said before, is unknown. The most likely vulnerabilities for are the slenderness of the ground floor columns, which is likely to trigger a soft story failure, and uh, the strong irregularity of the floor plan, as uh, seen before for the Palazzo Poggi. For this reason, it is considered that the most probable failure are caused by breakage of the masonry walls, the triggering of the soft uh, plane mechanism, and the brittle breakage of the columns. Large span also creates strong beams and weak pillars that is a potential weakness for the structure. The last of the three buildings I am presenting is the Department of Economics. The building is located in the neighborhood of Palazzo Poggi, uh, it dates back uh, to 1925 and was built to house forensic medicine. The structure, although uh, architecturally classical, has floors made of hollow clay slab. It is used as both classroom and office space. Uh, structural work was carried out in the 80s uh, because of cracks that had deformed on the main elevation. I report a plan including Palazzo Poggi and dating back to the early 30s. On the right, you can see an enlarged section of the ground and the first floor. It is interesting to see the photos of the time while the configuration has remained almost the same as can be seen from the elevations. Uh, in the image in the center, you can see the lesions that characterize the elevation facing Via San Giacomo. The slide shows the uh, recent photographs of the buildings with the two main elevations. The internal classroom, like the building, retains its original configuration. Here you can see four different points of view of the room. On a functional level, the structure, as mentioned above, is used as offices on the upper floor and as a large classroom on the ground floor. In addition to this, there is also a library represented in green in drawing. The upper floor, as said, is exclusively uh, dedicated to administrative, uh, administrative function. The offices are shown in blue and the corridor in pink. As for the other two buildings, um, the plans for, the, for this one were also in the possession of the University of Bologna. Photogrammetric and laser scanner survey were also carried out. No investigation of the materials was carried out uh, in this case either. For the evaluation hypothesis, the detected uh, conditions were assumed. Some small cracks are still present, as uh, shown in the photos on the side. Uh, the structure is in masonry with wooden and concrete floors. Um, so the present and previously repaired cracks uh, could indicate some small relative movements between the various parts of uh, the building. So 
um, the building may be subjected to criticality related to the foundation. The analysis uh, uh, relieve, uh, has said some criticalities and um, the most probable damage mechanism, uh, mechanism could be due to the crisis of the corners and the overturning out of plane of the facade. Okay, let's uh, now move to the non-university buildings and uh, let's start uh, with the one that is uh, certainly the most relevant on the square. Uh, that is the National Gallery of Bologna and the Fine Arts uh, uh, Academy. Uh, the Fine Art Academy, um, together with the National Gallery, is located in the former complex of the Church of Sant'Ignazio, um, the Jesuit novel, uh, which was built uh, by Alfor Alfonso Torregiani. Uh, the Academy was previously located in, in Palazzo Poggi, so here in this building, and was then moved uh, to this uh, convent uh, complex, uh, which had been uh, suitably adapted uh, in this period. The former church uh, was transformed into the lecture hall uh, of the Academy. Um, later, the so-called uh, Collamarini area, which is this part, uh, was headed um, about in the 20s of the 20th century, and the art school, which is this one, was recently added in the last years. Uh, the academy hosts uh, teaching rooms uh, um, in its interior spaces and uh, for theoretical activity and uh, workshops. Uh, the National Gallery uh, was founded in uh, 1808 as the portrait, portrait Gallery of the Academy, uh, which is located next to him, as we uh, were seeing. Uh, at the time, uh, it uh, hosted almost a thousand paintings from the suppression of churches and convents uh, in the Napoleonic uh, period. And, uh, and throughout the 19th century, alls and paintings increased following the suppression implemented by the new state, Italian state, um, and also for donations by families and acquisitions. Um, the great uh, the increase in the dimension of the buildings took place between uh, um, the 1914 and 1920, when the addition uh, uh, of the corridor leading to the um, large uh, uh, rectangular uh, octagonal room, which is the actual auditorium, was designed by the architect uh, Edoardo Colamarini. And then in the second post-war period with the construction of the Renaissance Hall and uh, with the um, re-adaptation. Uh, the last adaptation of the exhibition spaces uh, dates back to 1974 when in this uh, uh, occasion uh, the actual access staircase was uh, realized inside an ancient chapel of the uh, complex. Um, the heritage of the National Gallery is uh, very rich uh, and it, in it includes uh, testimonies of Italian paintings art from the 14th to the 18th century. Uh, one of the masterpieces uh, um, is The Ecstasy of Santa Cecilia, painted for Bologna by Raffaello. But there are also uh, works by Giotto, Parmigianino, Carracci, Guidoreni, Domenichino, and Guercino. Unfortunately, it is closed uh, in the afternoon. Uh, we tried to uh, organize a guided tour for you, but unfortunately, their opening time uh, did not permit this. But if you want to go and see it in the next days, it is a really good experience. We tested it. Yes. yes. <laughs> Here we can see some pictures of the exterior of the building, of the complex, let's say. And here we can see the internal distribution of the rooms at the ground floor. Um, for um, the part of the Fine Art uh, uh, Academy, um, it uh, uh, hosts uh, um, some uh, um, offices. Um, but mainly uh, spaces dedicated to teaching activities and workshops. So painting, sculpture and incision workshops are located here in the uh, brown area. 
light brown here, orange in the screen, <laughs> here dark brown. Uh, anatomy decoration are at the first floor, so not in this uh, floor. Um, and scenography workshop are located in the theater, so inside the courtyard. Then there is a gym, offices, and the beautiful lecture hall that you can see here in this picture. In the first one, it uh, still has uh, the shape, the conformation of a church, so it is a beautiful space. And you can see also the entrance with the sculpture corridor and the courtyard, um, uh, which is uh, um, shared with the National Gallery. Um, in the other part, on the right part of the ground floor, there is only the entrance of the National Gallery, but uh, uh, all the uh, spaces uh, or the halls related to National Gallery are in the upper floors. So most of the area uh, at the upper floor is occupied by exhibition areas in orange here, but there are also offices and the beautiful library that uh, is included in the offices. Here are some images of the exhibition areas. Uh, the layout of the exhibition area remained unchanged since 1974 when the last uh, uh, reorganization was made. Uh, as far as the analysis phases uh, are concerned, uh, only fewer documents have been found than those of the university, university building that uh, Lorenzo has just showed you. Uh, so only an expedition survey uh, was conducted and plans, uh, the floor plans, derived from the cadastral sheets, the local cadastral sheets. Oops. Um, for the facades, we did uh, uh, a photogrammetric survey, uh, and also in this case, no survey was possible to identify the construction techniques. Uh, and furthermore, we had no information about the really recent interventions. The last one were dating back to uh, the 70s. From the conservation point of view, the building is in an excellent condition. Um, um, and uh, uh, the, present, uh, the presence of uh, false ceilings and double walls in many halls was an obstacle to understand, of course, the construction techniques because floors and walls are not visible. So, uh, regarding the construction characteristics, characteristics uh, we uh, made uh, some uh, hypotheses and assumptions uh, were based on the construction characteristics of similar local buildings so in this case buildings for convent use or palaces what we were seeing in the pre previous presentation uh, so uh, we guessed the uh, um, brick uh, measuring with uh, a very good quality timber floors and brick vaults uh, uh, with tie roads, uh, mainly timber roofs. Uh, uh, we saw them, but they are not in the picture <laughs> inside the, this presentation. And uh, brick foundations. Uh, so building vul vulnerabilities uh, were directly derived from the assumptions on the construction techniques. Uh, and uh, um, we are... Um, can uh, see that there are actually no evident cracks or damages on the buildings, nor inside nor outside. Uh, so uh, the building vulnerabilities were identified in the high deformability of floors and roofs, uh, the presence uh, of porticos and brick pillars, the presence of large holes, so the consequence, uh, consequent widespread absence of a box-like behavior for a measure building. Uh, walls uh, um, have not a great thickness, so that sometimes they are slim um, and uh, um, they can cause uh, um, uh, a slenderness of the wall if, when they are very high, when they have a great height. Uh, um, it is possible that uh, there is an absence of connection between floors, roofs and walls and there can be trusses, uh, trusts from coming from roofs. So, um, building uh, vulnerabilities uh, directly generates the possible failure mechanisms. The most probable for these buildings are the out-of-plane overturning of the elevation, 
for all the facade or for the top floor only. Let's move to the so-called sandal buildings. We are calling it like that because it really does not a real have a real name. So for us, it is the sandal building today. Uh, it was designed uh, in 1934 by the architect Giuseppe Gualandi, and it is made with a load masonry structure um, with a particular solution for the portico at the ground floor. Uh, it, is, uh, it has always been intended for commercial activities and uh, residential uh, um, functions. Um, uh, commercial activities are located at the ground floor and large apartments uh, uh, are present at the upper floors. Uh, probably it has not uh, been significantly transformed over time. Uh, here we can see the original project of the building, uh, which was found uh, at the historical archive of the municipality of Bologna. Here are the plans and uh, a section, and here is the facade, the main facade facing directly on Piazza Pontoni. And here is the sandal. <laughs> the, so the building has uh, the typical appearance of local buildings designed and built in the 30s in the city of Bologna with the use of bricks, uh, solid bricks in this period and uh, plastered surfaces imitating stones in the basement. It has a portico at the ground floor on the main street and a curved shape on the corner with the very large openings in the corner. The sandal is a typical element of, uh, uh, 30, um, uh, of architectures dating back to the 30s in Bologna. I don't know why, but we also have one on the Faculty of Engineering and probably you will see it uh, tomorrow again. And this one uh, says uh, citizens can always count the hours clearly. <laughs> At the ground floor, we mainly find commercial activities, as I was saying, and apartments at the upper floor. These are very large apartments for the um, standard, for the actual standards of the city center. Um, as for the previous buildings, uh, only an expeditious survey was conducted and plans derived uh, from the cadastral sheets. Uh, we used the photogrammetry for the uh, survey of the facades and also in this case no survey was possible to identify the construction characteristics because uh, it was not possible to assess the private uh, apartments. Uh, the building is in good conditions, um, so also in this case, uh, assumptions uh, have been based uh, on the construction characteristics of similar buildings in the city. In this case, buildings from uh, having a, a residential use dated back to the 30s. We can see there is a pre, uh, prefabricated, uh, there is the use of prefabricated pillars in the portico at the ground floor, uh, but uh, for the uh, um, elevation of the other floors, uh, brick masonry was used and it probably it has a good quality. Uh, a steel floor with a prefabricated slab is present on the ground floor. And uh, we guess uh, instead all of brick floors at the other level, so at the upper levels. Uh, probably there is a steel roof, and of course there are concrete foundation because they are uh, uh, they were very used uh, in this period. Um, the uh, building uh, vulnerabilities in this case are the possible deformability of floors uh, and roofs. Uh, especially for the prefabricated one, which probably is not connected to the support element. Uh, the presence of the portico with uh, the prefabricated pillars, uh, walls uh, that have uh, a small thickness in relation to the height of the building, uh, the possible absence of connection between floors, uh, roofs and walls and possible trust from the roof, even if it is uh, a metal and um, a steel solution. Uh, in this case, uh, the most probable uh, uh, failure mechanism are the gable overturning and the simple out of plane overturning. 
Finally, uh, the ancient residential buildings, which are located uh, um, in front of the Sandel buildings and in front of the academy, um, they are an evidence on, of how the area around the square was before the reorganization links to the university project. Um, and uh, they represent the typical urban fabric uh, of Bologna and the transformations it suffered during its life. Uh, their precise dating is unknown, but uh, their layout uh, seems to refer to the 13th or from the 13th to the 16th centuries. Uh, they were not the subject of reconstruction, well, say the art, the reconstruction intervention of the 60s, the one uh, I was talking about in the previous pre presentation. Um, and their structure have been only partially changed, changed during their life. Here are some pictures of the external of the buildings on Via Zamboni, which is the street uh, just outside here and the back street, which is Via Belle Arti, uh, where the National Gallery and the Fine Arts uh, Academy are located. Um, the internal distribution uh, shows uh, um, that uh, a large part uh, of the ground floor is dedicated to commercial activities. Uh, all the, um, the spaces on Via Zamboni are commercial activities, while apartments are located also at the ground floor on Via Belle Arti. And uh, uh, all uh, the upper floors are dedicated to apartments for both sides. Uh, here too, it was not possible to access uh, the buildings, of course, and only an expedition survey was conducted. The procedure was the same with the uh, cadastral plans, photogrammetry for the uh, elevation. Um, buildings uh, have some cracks uh, and damages, but we will see them better tomorrow, uh, this afternoon, during uh, the, our uh, study visiting, visit on site. Uh, in also, in this case, uh, uh, the assumptions were based uh, on the construction characteristics of similar local buildings. So, in this case, ancient masonry buildings referring to the terrace, the uh, house type. Uh, so, we guess the use of brick masonry walls with uh, fair quality, timber floors and uh, all brick floors when they have been substituted probably timber roofs and brick foundations. We can see, we saw that uh, the, some reinforcement uh, intervention have been applied on pillars uh, at the ground floor for some buildings, and uh, we will see this uh, this afternoon. Um, this building vulnerabilities are the possible, uh, for, uh, for this building, the vulnerabilities are the possible deformability of floors and roof, the presence of porticos and brick pillars, large holes, and the consequent absence of box like behavior for uh, masonry walls, the small thicknesses of some walls in relation to the high. Uh, the possible absence of connection and the pos uh, possible trust from the roof. So finally, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the main failure mechanism are the gable overturning and the simple out of plane overturning. So to conclude, this presentation shows how the case of Piazza Puntoni reflects uh, a real case not only for building types and construction types, but also be, uh, because of the different levels of knowledge that can be achieved when working on, uh, working on existing buildings. So um, in this case, uh, uh, we had a good uh, amount uh, of information for university buildings, but not for the other one. So uh, this uh, could be a problem for um, a quantitative method of assessment, but uh, it is suitable for an expeditious method. So, um, in fact, uh, in an expeditious method, it is often not possible to carry out detailed investigations, detailed uh, inspections, and a lot of data must be deduced from the previous knowledge uh, of the construction characteristics of similar building types. 
Um, as expected the, from the beginning, the highest uh, probability indexes uh, for the activation of uh, kinematic mechanisms have been found in the ancient residential buildings because of the materials, because of the solutions. So uh, this uh, um, constitutes the vulnerability that we, uh, gave, we give uh, to the building. But uh, um, we think that a further step must be made, and this uh, idea came to us just visiting the, uh, this, the space of the square, because it is important to know also uh, the occupancy of the buildings. Now, today we know the construction solution, the function inside, but we need the, to know the number of persons living in these uh, buildings. Actually, from the data um, we had informally, let's say, from the uh, uh, people supporting us uh, uh, in, in the organization of the study visit, we uh, can guess that uh, more or less uh, uh, 700 people could be present inside these buildings uh, before, of course, the pandemic uh, at the same time. So it is a very high number and uh, we have to take this into consideration in the assessment method, so in the definition of the assessment method as the exposure, the building exposure. So this will be a first step that we will include in the uh, expeditious assessment methods. So that's all. This time I really finished <laughs> all my presentations.